Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, well, um, it's my pleasure to have uh, Ryan Kastner here today. Uh, I've known Ryan for quite a while. Um, we actually worked on a bunch of projects today, and I think uh, one of the things that sets him apart is that he does a lot of work um, sort of across the stack, both uh, building real useful things and also figuring out new ways to build useful things. Um, and today he's going to be talking all about uh, some of his simulate and eliminate uh, methods for designing multi-core architectures. So, thanks. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Um, so uh, I'll just start off with uh, an explanation of what I do. A lot of people um, ask me this, either researchers or family members or things like that. And uh, I usually say, well, I do uh, work in embedded systems. And then depending on how well you know that field, you can uh, understand what that is or maybe don't understand what that is. And my typical definition is it's something that's not a desktop computer. So it's something you think of it as not being a computer. So some of the applications that I do that I'll talk about briefly at the beginning of the talk uh, are these uh, financial computation, ecological monitoring, robotics, biotech, and uh, some vision. Um, so this is a quote at the bottom from um, about 10 years ago, actually, a National Research Council report that said the use of embedded computers throughout society will dwarf previous milestones in information revolution. So I think at this point, that's probably a true quote. Uh, so let me go into some of these, quickly go through some of these applications and, and give you a, a feel of what we're doing, starting with, uh, with vision. Um, so over the past couple of years, pretty much since I've been at uh, UC San Diego, uh, I've been starting to, to look at, um, to, at vision type stuff. Um, and the thing we've been focusing on is object detection. And uh, we're using um, a well-known technique for this uh, called Biela Jones, uh, which is used as things called uh, HAR classifiers, which are uh, these little rectangly things um, to figure out whether or not there's an object in uh, a video stream or a picture. And the way it does it is um, there's some magic to figuring out what HAR classifiers you actually want to use. And this is some, some um, pretty cool uh, AI work um, this actually was done by a professor at UC San Diego, uh, Yoav Freund, um, uh, an algorithm called Adaboost. Um, there's a lot of magic there. I don't quite understand it. You just give, uh, give these features to this algorithm, and magically it figures out which ones are good. Um, so once it comes with you, say, okay, I have a feature like this. I'm looking for um, eyes and nose, or I'm looking for two eyes and a bridge in the, uh, your nose, or something like this. And you go through these things sequentially, and there's about 2,000 of these, 2,100 of these things um, that's being done. And they have some um, uh, ways of speeding this up in software. So they, they, they do, like the first three of these, will figure out with 50% 50, 50 chance if there's a face or not there. And then you go through seven of them, and that gets you down to 25% and so on and so forth. But it's pretty com complex. Um, and what you have to do with these features is actually um, for each region, um, sum up all the pixels in that region and then multiply them by some weight. Um, and these, all these rectangles, these 2,000, 2,100 rectangles are, are given to you um, in a form like this. Uh, you sum it up. You say, am I greater than this threshold, which is also magically found out by this added boost algorithm. And if I'm greater than it, I take the left value. If I'm not greater than it, I take the right value. Um, and then I have these stage thresholds where I say, um, is there a face here with some sort of uh, reasonable uh, ability? Um, so what we've done is we've done that really quickly. Um, we've also been able to implement this in hardware on FPGAs um, that, that take advantage of the parallelism. So we can do rotations. Uh, we can do arbitrary rotations, but usually not upside down. Um, so usually your face is in some sort of angles like this. Uh, but if we wanted to do more rotations, by finding trapeze artist or something like that, we can certainly certainly do that. And you can also trade for, uh, for different types of things. So this is all trained on the front. Um, you can trade for side profiles pretty easily, and then you can look for both of those at the same time. So whether or not uh, you're finding this uh, person uh, is, is, uh, depends on what you're training on. So this is, you guys know what this video is. Do I dare play 
play the audio for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. So it's a, it's a good example. And that's actually running through our system. So um, if you come and visit, and you guys are all welcome to come visit, I can show you this in my lab and uh, get 20 people in there, and they can find all these faces. Um, so that's one thing. And you'll see actually a vision coming up a lot in these other different projects, um, particularly in this biotech stuff that I'm doing. Um, so an example, yeah. So you're just, is there just a massive amount of parallelism in trying to find these features um, there? Or so, there? yeah, uh, it's actually the hardest part is the streaming, the data. Um, so with, especially with FPGAs, you can get the basically pixel in, you do the detection on. You buffer a lot of data, but you get pixel in, and then you do the detection. Um, there's not a we're not doing a ton of kind of parallel operations. We're looking for these HAR features in parallel. And we also thought about looking stages in parallel, but that didn't make a whole lot of sense uh, just for this application. But the biggest gain you're getting is, is the, ac the ability to access all of, all of the data that you want at the same time. So you can have like a, a register file with uh, 100 ports on it, and then you can get all the pixel data at once, and then you can stream it in so it does all these nice like just moving of data. So that's, that's kind of where. Uh, you get this 100 frames per second versus, I don't know, something like a half frame per second in the software. Um, um, so going on the biotech stuff, so this is also a recent thing, uh, past year or so, uh, working with some people, some collaborators in um, the bioengineering department at UC, UC San Diego. Uh, so one thing that they do, um, and I work with a, a, a lot of people in, in uh, the cardiac area, um, uh, one thing that they do is they're trying to figure out the mechanics of hearts after they do some sort of treatment to it or just trying to understand generally what, what's going on with the heart. Um, so they have this interesting setup um, where you can, um, you can take an animal and you can sacrifice that animal and take out the heart and then uh, put it in the solution. And this, diff this solution diffuses uh, the heart and allows it to live up to something like eight hours longer. Uh, and then they can look at the heart and see how it's beating, for instance. Um, a lot of times they'll give it a heart attack beforehand, let it live for a little while, and then they, they pull out the heart. Or they can actually uh, uh, probe the heart and uh, make it beat, so you can cause arrhythmias and different types of things here. And what they want to do is they want to find out essentially what the voltage is across the heart. And the way they do that is they, uh, they put a, um, a fluorescent, uh, a voltage fl uh, sensitive fluorescent dye uh, into the solution. And so whenever the heart beats, it's a voltage, the, the intensity of that dye increases. And then you can take these cameras, and these are extremely high speed cameras, 100 frames, 1,000 frames per second, 100 by 100 images. And uh, each pixel gives you some area of the heart depending on how close you are to the heart. Um, and this, this setup has two with different filters uh, for different dyes. And then you get data like I'm showing you here. Um, the intensity of the, the dye is inversely proportional to the voltage, so you want to flip it. Uh, you can see it's pretty noisy, um, and you're doing a lot of, uh, just a lot of operations. So, for instance, they have all this code written in MATLAB. They've given us this code written in MATLAB. And about three seconds of video takes them about 16 hours on a cluster to analyze, to do all the analysis of this. So basically, just going from here to here takes them about 16 hours for three seconds. So it's good to try to make that faster. Um, a lot of times they find out way after the fact that uh, they weren't doing some, something correct, which means another rat has to be sacrificed or another pig has to be sacrificed, or they just wasted a ton of time. Because um, unfortunately, Yep. Access in the charts? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, this is time, and this is voltage. Uh, this is actually the, right here, this is the fluorescence of the So this is for one single location? Or uh, one, yeah, one location. And then there are 100 by 100 of these for these cameras, 1,000 frames per second. Okay, yeah. So the location is about what one millimeter? Uh, it, it it depends on uh, just the, what your your uh, camera angle is. Are you building volumes of this? Building what? Bo volumes. Uh, they 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 want to do multi, but they only do one right now. So they have not done, they have not done volumes. I think they might have done two, um, but uh, yeah, they haven't done. But more. that was actually an interesting problem to see. Yeah, how to reconstruct and uh, yeah, definitely. I thought it was already done, quite frankly. Um, I mean, there's there's ways to, to, to mold this, um, and this technique is is you know ten years old or something like yes. that. It's just uh, it's just all running in MATLAB. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, definitely not something that, that that's new. Um, but just doing it, being able to do it quickly, do it real time, um, is something that they uh, they're really interested in. Um, yeah, that is that is the problem. So you know, giving a 
a, a rat, a heart attack, they let it live for a couple, couple, couple weeks, and then they do this, and they find out they messed up because they weren't pacing it at the right place or something like that. Um, yeah, it causes a lot of money and a lot of time. So it's not like us where we can just sit down and, uh, well, the Xilinx stuff takes a little bit longer to compile, but it's not, you know, two weeks or a month to do this kind of stuff. Um, so this is what it looks like after it's done. Um, on the left, it's the initial data, which is actually running, but you probably can't tell it's running. Um, and then on the right, it's um, showing you what's done after processing. Um, so the big flashes are, are the heart beating over that area. Um, this is uh, some dead tissue that's uh, probably from a heart attack that they gave it. Uh, so another thing that we're looking at is um, um, a lot of the bioengineering stuff is, is really kind of primitive. And a lot of the problems that I work on, these people are doing very primitive type things. So there's a lot of great technology that we have that you guys have here that uh, other people have done um, that they just don't use or don't know how to use. Um, so another thing that's pretty primitive um, is looking for cardiac stem cells. So if you want to analyze these, essentially what they do is they take a plate of cells and they look through a microscope. They, they sit someone down there and look through the microscope. Usually this is a, a tech or a postdoc or a graduate student, or maybe if you're lucky, a good undergrad that does this. Um, but it's, it's, it's rather simple. Um, what you're trying to look for, you're basically trying to look for mature, uh, nice cells that you can use for your studies. Um, so this is kind of dark, um, but there are some cells in that uh, leftmost picture. Um, there are some nuclei here that you can find rather easily to figure out whether or not there's a cell. And um, you, again, you use uh, um, protein dyes that bind to different parts of the cell. So you can have a dye that uh, binds to the, uh, the, the part that is, of course wants to the nucleus. So you can find it. And then you also want to find, you also want to have cells that look a lot like this. Um, so these are nice striated cells, which you, these are muscle tissues. So these are very mature, so you definitely want to have these. And so there's ways of trying to do this, and this is the kind of stuff that we're looking at. And this, this technique here is a co-occurrence co co matrix to find out whether or not these, these, these are nice. And once you find it, there's machines that basically work as like a straw. And they can say, here's the x, y location, and just suck up that cell, and then you can use it later. So again, we're just trying to automate that. Uh, we've been working uh, a little bit in some financial computation. This is uh, kind of a hot topic recently, um, mainly because people like to make money, and people feel like you can make a lot of money doing this. Um, and there's a lot of uh, investment bankers and people that are, are, are using a lot of computers to, to, to make decisions. Uh, whether or not that's good or bad, I guess, is another story. Uh, one thing that we've looked at, um, a lot of people are looking at option pricing. Um, so we decided to try to find to do something different. Um, we've looked at uh, um, asset allocation, the problem of asset allocation. And these are really prime for uh, speed up space because you do a lot of Monte Carlo simulations. Monte Carlo simulations are pretty much independent. So this is the embarrassingly parallel uh, applications. Um, more recently, I've been looking at some value risk uh, type applications. So people, um, we've been working with um, a company called Accelerus. They make a jacket a MATLAB uh, to GPU a product that they're very interested in this. And also um, uh, Impulse-C, you know, people at Impulse-C, which is a C2 HDL tool. They're also very interested in doing this. So we've basically been evaluating. They've given us the tools, and we've been evaluating it on these applications. Okay. And the final thing I'm going to talk about is some ecological monitoring. Um, this is a project that I started when I was at Santa Barbara, um, maybe five or six, year, six years ago. Um, this is a project that gets you to travel to beautiful places, so that's uh, a nice benefit of that. Um, so there is a, um, a research site in the island of Morea, uh, French Polynesia, um, which is about 15, kilom 15 kilometers uh, northwest of Tahiti. So a small island, it's about 60 kilometers perimeter. Um, there's a UC research center there. Um, a Gump Center. So Gump was a very rich guy. San Francisco Gumps in downtown San Francisco, if you've ever been there. It's a fairly nice department store. Gave the land to UC many years ago when he died. Uh, and then they've made a, a NSF-sponsored long-term ecological research site there, mainly to study coral reefs. Um, so what they're doing there is they're trying to figure out what's going on with the coral reefs. These are very complex ecosystems um, that uh, have the corals themselves and also a lot of fish and nutrients, bacteria, things like that. They're trying to figure out how ocean acidification is changing this, how global warming is changing these kind of things, what they can do to, uh, to repopulate the reefs if they're dying, so on and so forth. Um, so these are some of the instruments that they use. Um, so this is another case where things are very primitive. Um, 
So the, the thermistor is just a temperature sensor, essentially. They usually put these on uh, moorings or uh, cabled lines, and they get depth temperatures over certain depths, which is interesting data to them. Um, a CTD measures conductivity, temperature, and depth. Um, and using those in combination, you can figure out the salinity of the water. So that's important for them as well. Um, the wave tide pressure sensor just is a very uh, sensitive pressure sensor that can tell how much water is above you. So that tells you about tides and waves. Um, and then ADPs and ADCPs are acoustic Doppler current profilers. Um, and these send out sound waves. And based on the reflections, you can, you can find out at a very fine scale, at centimeter resolution scale, how much current is, is going on in different, lo different locations. So these are all you know, great instruments. These instruments work. Um, these ADCPs are $20,000. These other instruments you know, are thousands of dollars. Um, but the way that they do it is something called what they call flipper net. So what they do is they take these instruments out, they dive down, as you can see in the center, and deploy these ADCPs. Uh, these ADCPs take data for, they usually deploy them for six to nine months, maybe sometimes up to a year, um, depending on the battery lives, and uh, log it internally, and then go back out in six to nine months and grab the instrument, download the data, and then put it on the internet. So there's no notion of uh, getting any sort of real-time data back. And so they're very interested in, in how do we get that real-time data. And real-time to them isn't anything close to what real-time to us is. Real-time to them is 15 minutes. So they would be just really ecstatic if they can get their data every 15 minutes. Um, if they could even understand if their, their instrument is working once a day, they would be very happy of that as well. Because a lot of times they, they, their stories, you know, horror stories of, I put these instruments out. And then a week later, it stopped working. And then six months to nine months later, uh, I go back out and I fi figure out a week after I deployed it, I stopped getting data. And that's basically another year on your PhD. Right? Uh, so this is a very bad thing. Um, so we've been working um, to build a low cost uh, device that allows uh, data communication between these. So essentially what I I'll call it a lot is an underwater moat is what we're trying to build. Um, so um, it's, it's uh, acoustic. It, trans, it communicates acoustically. So I'm, I'm trying to telemeter this data wirelessly back to the GUMP station. Um, RF just doesn't propagate more than, say, a meter underwater. So you have to use acoustics. Uh, acoustics are really slow, literally, compared to RF. So we're talking 1,500 meters per second versus speed of light for RF. So that causes a lot of problems. Data rates are tiny, um, 100 bits per second up to maybe 10,000 bits per second if it's a totally ideal condition and you're using crazy things like MIMO OFDM to do this. Um, the, the underwater environment is very harsh in terms of communicating. Um, there's a lot of multipath, especially when you're communicating um, in shallow water. So it's basically echoes that are going back and forth, so you have to deal with that. There's a lot of Doppler. Um, so the, the, the thing that's giving you those measurements of the current is you're using the Doppler effect um, it's something you're fighting against here in order to communicate uh, over distances. Um, and there are commercial modems. Uh, these commercial modems are typically $3,000 to $10,000 per modem. So they're very expensive. So it doesn't make sense to put a $100 thermistor temperature sensor on a $10,000 modem. So what we're trying to do is get this down to hundreds of dollars. And what we've done is gotten this down to about $500. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that. And the way we did it is with the transducer. Um, if you buy a commercial transducer, um, it costs 500 to several thousand dollars, depending on uh, what it is. Yeah. I have a question. How deep is the deepest point we are trying to measure? And how far from the island? Uh, they, they are very interested only uh, mainly around the island. So there, there are these lagoons here. This is where all the how coral reef. Um, it goes up to maybe. Uh, 10 meters, it's not that deep. In, in these channels here, you can take a ship, cruise ship into them. So that's maybe, you know, 20, 30 meters, something like that. But it's not that deep. We are talking no more of a distance, no more of five kilometers. Probably. Yeah, this is, um, so from here to about here is about two kilometers. Each one of these things is 20 kilometers. So it's like a 20 kilometers per side island, triangle island. Uh, I'm trying to get about two kilometers. With that's, I would be very happy with that. We've we've gotten uh, a kilometer. We tested in Mission Bay in San Diego, uh, off the docks, and we were able to get a kilometer. We could, um, I know we could have gone further if we had more space. We just didn't have any more space to go further. Um, so this is the big deal, right? We all know that electronics and computers are cheap, 
So I can get I can make this stuff really cheaply. You know, this is a I think fifteen dollar board that we've we designed and developed. But if you're going to buy a five hundred or three thousand dollar transducer, it just doesn't make any sense because that's your limiting cost. So what we did is we figured out can we do something cheap? And these transducers are just uh, ceramic elements, piezoelectric ceramic elements. So they're they're uh, transducing between acoustics, uh, uh, sound energy, and electrical energy. So they just vibrate essentially and create acoustic energy based on the electri electrical response and vice versa. When they move, when you have sound waves coming, they vibrate a little bit and create a response across them. Um, so what we did was we bought about 15 to 20 of these from China because it's the cheapest place to get these uh, ceramics and we, we put them in the water and see if any of these work across the pool. Uh, this one worked the best across the pool. Um, so it's about a 5 to $10 ceramic depending on how much, how much volume you, you buy of it. Um, you pot it, so these are two different potting, so just making sure it's waterproof. Um, and uh, it's not ideal, so it's obviously not, it's cheap, so you're, you're, you're not getting something, you're, you have to give up something in order to make it so cheap. Um, and what we've done is we've taken this cheap quality to it and built all of our electronics around that to try to leverage uh, this bad antenna, essentially, to, to, try to, to try to mask that effect. So we built all the analog stuff. And uh, we built uh, the digital, the digital modulation all around this. Um, so another thing that they, they want, uh, and they do everything pretty much on the cheap there, um, just because it's mainly NSF funded, and NSF just doesn't have, even though they give them a lot of money, they, uh, they just they can't do everything they want to do. So we've been build, building an underwater robot. Um, this is the Stingray. Um, it's supposed to look like a Stingray. I think it, they did a pretty good job of making it look like a stingray. It's a carbon fiber hull with 3D printed wings and 3D printed tails. So um, you can kind of see um, uh, this is what, it, what it's going to do soon is it's going to hover in a box. Um, so it's very agile. It has these uh, unique propellers called Voischneier propellers um, that allow it to move kind of like a helicopter. And then you can also, it has wings so you can take advantage of the lift. Um, so it's a pretty slick vehicle. Um, in terms of just how it looks and also um, the propeller system is, is very unique in terms of uh, underwater vehicles. I've never seen another water vehicle that has it. Um, so you'll see what's ha going to happen here. It's going to come forward. Um, these are the propellers here, these void propellers. And then it's going to move across and then move back in a box kind of fashion. Um, and uh, those voids are what's allowing it to do that. Uh, the voids give you your yaw. Um, so it's very nice for things like uh, corals, if you want to sit and watch a coral for a while, or like if you want to inspect a boat, the boat hull. So the Navy is very interested in that because they want to make sure there's no explosives on the boat hull. Um, it can hover. It can point and strafe. So it can just follow an object, sit there, and just look. Um, that's very nice. So these are propellers. Um, two in the wings, just normal propellers. Uh, those give you your, uh, your roll. One in the tail gives you your pitch. And then these voids, um, they spin. Um, they're facing down, and they spin. And there's about eight of these blades. And these blades are like wings. And these wings can move, and it gives you a force in any direction in your yaw. So we have two of those for that. Um, so using that, or just in general using other things, um, we're trying to find different types of objects underwater. Um, so I've just started recently working with Spaywar down in San Diego. It's a branch of the Navy that does a lot of research in underwater, of course. Uh, and they're interested in finding buoys or mines or other types of objects underwater. Um, so w finding buoys is you can do a rather simple technique of just color detection, erosion dilation, centroid calculation, figuring it out. Uh, and also we've been looking at combining sonar and optics. Um, so optics often don't work underwater very well because it might be cloudy. Um, so uh, you can use sonar, but you can see the resolution of the sonar is really bad. Um, so some ideas that we have, can we combine both of these at the same time? So just kind of like we look for features in the faces, can we look for features in both of these and, and use them simultaneously to, to find different objects? And we've also been working with NOAA um, a little bit to, to detect fish. So we can do the same thing um, using our hardware, uh, using the Bale Jones algorithm to find this fish. Uh, this is a scythe butterfly fish, is the, uh, the logo of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. Uh, so we got a bunch of video in the back of the Birch Aquarium. Uh, they were nice enough to let us in there, and we can train it on that. 
Uh, the NOAA people are more interested in, in figuring out how many fish are in the water, so they'll take ROVs down with a couple cameras, and they'll, they mainly look for rockfish because that's what's mostly on the coast of California. I'm not sure if the rockfish are up here, but probably. Um, and they count them, they classify them, number of types, and then they make uh, fishing strategies based off of this. Um, also more recently, they've been looking into stereo vision type things so they can get the lengths of the fish as well. Um, so this is not easy. Um, they have weeks of data that essentially they have to have someone sit and look through and find and count these fish. So they're really interested in automating this, this process. Okay, so that's kind of like the overview of the applications my lab does. Um, so in the million dollar question to me, because a lot of the, the research that I do is figuring out how do I take all these applications and put it onto to something like an FPGA or, or how do I accelerate this GPU or some other hardware ASIC. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about now. So that was kind of the main thing. So a very long aside to get to the main part of the, 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 uh, of the talk. So thinking about this and thinking about something very simple that we all understand is, you know, I want to build a matrix multiplication unit. Okay, so I'm going to get some application, maybe it's vision or maybe it's controls. Um, and I need to do this matrix multiplication. It's a four by four matrix, very simple. So how do I design this and how do I build hardware for this? And most people, if they build hardware, they you know, know the first thing is to look at the, the application and look at the code that you have and figure out, you know, what are my de data dependencies? So maybe build a data flow graph or something like that, controlled data flow graph or something more fancy, PDG. Um, so I have this. This gives me one element. Um, and then I have a lot of choices, even on this very simple matrix multiplication uh, computation. So I can do this 16 times for each of those 16 elements. I can do these all in parallel um, and so on and so forth. So many different ways. And the idea is that we can build some tools that will actually allow us to do this automatically. Okay. So let me go over some of the tools that exist and then try to make an argument on why they're not the best in order to do this. Um, so MATLAB is used a lot by pretty much, I don't know, any, everybody that I work with that's not a computer scientist pretty much uses MATLAB. So I think that's probably where most of the code that we get at least comes from. Um, and then there are model-based tools, what they call model-based tools for doing this, some from, um, from Xilinx, some from actually MathWorks themselves. Um, Simplify is from um, Synopsis now, so it was a simplicity thing. And what these do is they give you a bunch of cores, uh, predefined elements, so like multiplies or adders um, or more complex things. They may give you like a matrix inversion or matrix multiplication. And you kind of figure out what the data flow is yourself. Um, you connect these cores up, and uh, and it looks that's that's from uh, that's from system generator. So that's uh, something like that. The problem is when you get something more complex, is it starts to look more like this. Um, and this is a real design. I think this is just for matrix multiplication. So it's not that complicated of a thing. Um, but you have to wire everything together, and you have to figure out the control, which is the biggest pain in the butt part. So figuring out how to, how, when do I schedule all of these things? What are all these functional units doing? That's the biggest issue there. Um, so essentially, you're just writing in a graphical ver version of RTL. Right? This is, uh, it looks nice, but it's, it's basically graphical RTL. Um, there's another tool um, that I'm not sure if it's even still around now. Uh, they stopped developing this. Uh, it was called Excel DSP. Um, it got bought by Xilinx uh, many years ago. The idea there was you take MATLAB and just automatically translate it into RTL, uh, which can work well in some cases, but uh, isn't the best, and Xilinx just kind of gave up on it. So uh, I don't, that, I think, says something about the tool itself. Um, and we're saying, well, maybe simulating and, elim uh, and eliminate this tool that we have will, will be a good solution to this. And there are a bunch of C-based tools, so those are all MATLAB tools, a bunch of C ones. So System C is kind of a very general one that they're trying to get a, a lot of uh, uh, people behind. Um, it's just a language that allows you to develop these different tools off of. Um, Impulse, Catapult, uh, I work with both of those companies uh, mainly to use their tools to develop those tools uh, to give them feedback on on what they're good at and what they're not good at. Um, and Auto ESL is a, a recent tool uh, out of uh, UCLA, uh, Jason Kong's group, that uh, I, haven't played, I haven't had a chance to work with, but uh, seems, seems to be getting a lot of good press. 
And then you have some kind of more specific tools. These are mainly targeted at their own boards um, and mainly targeted at specific languages. Um, some more uh, early academic type projects um, targeted at different uh, specific applications, so like DSP applications. And then Apice was a very old project uh, as well. Um, so how almost all of these tools work, and I think I can probably blanket state that all of these tools work this way, but you know, being, uh, uh, having been wrong many, many times in my life, I say almost all, all of these tools, how they work, is they analyze the code that you give them, and they create some sort of graph, a dependency graph out of them. So the simplest form is a data flow graph. And then they try to piece this data flow graph together in a way that creates a data path. Right. So this is, works well. Um, and the process is, you know, there are different steps to this. You schedule it. You figure out when your operations, at what time they should go to. Um, based on that, you do binding. So you actually put the operations uh, to different functional units. Uh, you do allocation. So you figure out how many registers you have. Uh, you bind your data to those registers. You figure out how many functional units I have, how many adders, multipliers. You bind your operations to those. And then you create the control all around that. So when you do that whole process, you get some sort of uh, finite state machine controller. And based on all that, you should know the values of all of that. Um, so using these tools, or having my graduate students use these tools, the, the things they complain about the most um, is, one, you can't just automatically give it a big piece of code. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and this is the, the biggest thing that they get upset about is you know, they, they say, oh, this is a C, give it any C and it works. And they give it any C, they give it face detection and it doesn't work. And I say, well, ha -ha, you know, that's, I knew that was going to happen, but uh, um, that's just the issue. You have to program in a certain way. Um, they're not scalable. So even if I program it in a nice way, how they want me to program in it, um, it, it typically doesn't go around over 500 lines of code. It just kind of stops. There's a lot of analysis that you have to do in order to figure out how the scheduling, resource allocation, and binding is done. Um, and uh, you just can't figure it out. Um, you don't have much control. And some tools give you more control over it than others. Um, but you, you can't really say, I want to do the binding this way. Or I want to kind of guide the tool in, in some way. It just kind of figures it out. And you can say, I want to pipeline it. Or I want to maybe uh, give more or less uh, resources to it. But you can't do very specific things. And then if you want to do very specific things, you get this just crazy code out that you can't understand. It's just this RTL that to do a very simple thing is you know, 100,000 lines of code, so, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff. So you just can't sit there and say, OK, what is this doing, even after the fact? So what we're saying is, why don't we flip this over and take what we, we would say is a top to bottom approach. So we've been researching. We, you know, the royal we have been researching how do we make a general purpose architecture work really well for a long, long time, right? So this general purpose architecture, and you can pick your favorite general purpose architecture, um, will work very well in the, in the general case, right? So it's going to find, be a great solution uh, um, that's flexible and programmable for all applications in some sense. However, if I throw a specific application at it, it's not going to be the best, right? Because it's made to do anything for anybody. Right? So the idea is we start with this. We start with this really well-known solution. And then we take an application and we see what don't we need. And we throw all that extra stuff away. Okay? And we'll see how that works compared to this bottom up, where we start with this code and we try to piece together you know, in, in some sense, the general case is with all these tools, if we give it all applications, ideally it would come to something like this, right? But that's like, uh, you know, creating AI that can just do this 30 years of work that we've done ourselves. Um, so let's see how it works. So this is how we get the algorithm in. We analyze it. Um, I'll go quickly through this. We create instructions, um, all well-known stuff. You can do some sort of error analysis on this. Um, so the tool, the tool that we've made actually does this now. Uh, you can compare what you have uh, versus MATLAB, and you can change different things. Like you can change how many functional units you have. The, the bit widths are the most important things that you get here. So I can vary my bit widths, and I can see how does that compare to a double precision. Okay, so that's important, but it's a relatively trivial step to do. Um, then once you have that, you can figure out what all your data is. Um, of course, you can automate that, and there are techniques that you can do to automate figuring out how wide your, your data is. Um, we've created a, a, 
uh, instruction uh, or an architecture that uh, does um, uh, um, in order, pro so it issues one instruction at a time, but does um, uh, dynamically finds operands and dynamically schedules uh, these operands to, to functional units um, and uh, has a dynamic memory controller. So it's uh, kind of an old architecture, Thomas Hula type architecture. Okay, so what you do is you start and you issue in your instructions, if, and then this is figuring out everything for you, right? It's figuring out where do I do the binding? Where do I put these instructions on the functional units? And where is my memory? Okay, and then I'm done because I need to know if I can start the next instruction, so on and so forth. So the idea is you can look at it and um, just eliminate stuff that, that's unnecessary. So let's go into that in, into a little more detail. So everything essentially right now is fully connected. So you have to be, be able to talk from all your functional units to all of your, your ports on your memory. Um, and then you have to be able to get data from all of your ports on your memory to all your functional units, so on and so forth. So this matrix, this kind of interconnect matrix, which is a bunch of boxes, is a fully connected matrix. Um, but what we can do is we can say for a specific application that we want to design for, maybe we don't need a functional unit, right? We've given it all these functional units. We never use this, or we rarely use this. Let's just get rid of it. And maybe these functional units only get their data from certain places in memory. Okay, so let's get, of, get rid of some of these kind of crosses in the matrix, in the interconnect matrix. Let's just get rid of them. And that eliminates boxes and makes things a lot smaller. Okay. So how do we do that? We collect a lot of scheduling information. Um, so we actually take, we have this general purpose architecture. We take the application that we want to run or the set of applications that we want to run on it. Um, we, um, we run it through model sim. We figure out what's important for us. Um, and then we use that information to, to eliminate some of the, uh, the, the parts of the, uh, the uh, architecture. Yeah? Find out what's important for um, you. So important is, so for instance, one thing that we'll look at is do we use a resource? So it's important to know that is this adder being used? Um, other things that, that we find out are, here's my picture, is this link ever being used? So is this link from memory out, from this memory port, going to this, say, this functional unit input ever being used? Things like that. So it seemed to me that the scalability of this approach was seriously hindered by running through models, because that's an incredibly detailed simulator that you're not going to be able to get any kind of long-term application behavior out of. Um, so how can you be sure that something isn't used um, over the lifetime of something that runs for... Yeah, so, so we're not doing anything data dependent. So that's one thing that I think people all often, we often, I think, fail to explain very well. Um, so we're, we're, we're only looking at uh, data independent type things. And we're only looking at sp specific things. So we don't look at every, every signal. And we're only saying we, we need to look at these signals. Yeah, yeah, that's that. But you know, that's that's a big deal because you it, we're, we're getting rid of this stuff, and it's dependent on the data. Then the data comes in, and it just doesn't work, right? So you have to do data independent type things. So this also assumes that the inefficiencies in the conventional processor are due to kind of extra extra ports in memory yep. or, or, or things like yep. that. But I mean. Do you really think that, <laughs> that that's what it is? I so, mean, it's lack of parallelism. It's, it's uh, yeah. the sequentiality of, of, of expressing the Yeah, so, so I'll get to this. Um, <laughs> maybe if you give me a little bit of time and think, keep that. And, um, so definitely the parallelism issue. And then, so I'm just focusing kind of single core right here. But there's ways to go multi-core, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then I'll show you the results that compare this with the other tools. And then you, know, you can believe me or not believe me after that. But uh, you know, I'll show you the real things. So. So before we kind of argue about that, let's let me just figure, show you what's going on. So this architecture is just an architecture we, you know, kind of out of uh, Patterson Hennessy's book, old, old books. I mean, it's nothing super special. And you could do this with any architecture. So it's not very, it doesn't have to be specific to this architecture. So just to kind of give you an idea of what we're doing, um, the instruction controller looks for the instructions and it tries to figure out the binding information. And it also tries to figure out where the data is. So those are the two things the instruction controller does. 
And so in order to do that, it has to talk to all the functional units and has to dynamically track where all, what's going on essentially with all the functional units and what's going on with all the data. And what we could do is we could just say, I'm going to simulate my architecture and figure out for every instruction what's, when I need to do this. So I can essentially get rid of all this dynamic tracking and just put it into a finite state machine and say, okay, at this time, you go here. At this time, you go here, and here's where your data is. Here's where you're going to get your data from. Okay. Um, so that's kind of like moving all dynamic to all static. Um, and we found that this isn't the best thing to do. So we, we kind of take a quasi approach. And the reason why that isn't the best thing to do is because we get this finite state machine that's, that's um, uh, contingent on the cycle that we're at. Because it says, at cycle one, do this. At cycle three, do this. At cycle five, do this. Okay. And so that finite state machine becomes quite large. And in some cases, it becomes larger than just dynamically tracking everything. Okay. So what we've done is we said, well, some of the things we don't we want to make static and other things we don't want to we want to make dynamic so for instance figuring out the binding so figuring out dynamically figuring out where do i put this operation on what functional unit do i put up this operation that makes sense to make to make it static figuring out where my data is that makes sense to make static so the, the instruction can just come in and say here is where you're going and here is where you're getting your data from uh, but what it doesn't do is, is it doesn't say at a certain cycle. So it essentially waits and says, from the functional units, it says, okay, I'm ready, then send this. Uh, next thing is ready, now send this. So it knows where it's going, and it just has to say, okay, I, just have, I know where I'm going. I just have to wait for this functional unit to say I'm ready, and then I send that data. So it's still tracking whether or not the functional units are executing or not executing, but it's not trying to figure out where do I put it, where do I get the data. So we figured out just kind of through uh, trial and error that this works the best in terms of, 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 uh, of area and timing. Um, so you can just do some kind of basic chart showing how does the number of functional resources and how does the number of entries and how does the instruction controller scale. Um, so obviously as you have more functional units and as you have more memory entries and these are you can think of as register files, um, it's going to get larger. So this kind of points to the fact that if you give it a huge application and I need to run it really fast, I'm going to need a lot of these, this isn't going to work very well. And so our approach to that is you do multi-core type stuff. So this is still single core. So kind of the, 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 the big story is this, is this slide. So looking at um, what do you get when you actually go from this dynamic tracking to this kind of static, half static, half dynamic thing. And you get some pretty huge, pretty huge savings. So area is you know, 95% of what it, what it is. And then you can see the critical path in terms of the instruction controller is a lot, a lot slower as well. So you're gaining a lot. You're gaining a lot by getting rid of, getting rid of this dynamic tracking and moving to static. OK. So let's go to a different part of it and think about the resource trimming. So what all the functional units are doing is they're looking, you're going to get instructions sent out, and you have to say, is this for me? So the instruction controller said, here's where you're going. So all of these functional units have to sit there and say, okay, here's an instruction that's coming, is it for me? And then they also have to figure out where the operands are. So this is the dynamic stuff that we were doing before in the general case. And then we have to look for the operands, and then we have to grab them from the matrix if they're available. Okay, and then once we find them, we execute, and then we say, we're done, it goes back. Um, so kind of looking and seeing how much time am I spending or how much logic am I spending looking for doing all this dynamic tracking. And it's pretty significant. Okay, so 60 to 80 percent, something like that. So the functional, you can think of this as this is the good stuff. I need this. These are my resources, resource area. But the control stuff is you can think of, well, this is what I can optimize away. Or you can think of this as an Andel's law kind of case, right? Here's how much I can gain I could because I can... You know, I can't get rid of this. I need to do adds and multiplies and things like that. But I could, can get rid of my controller. So this is the case where we just look and we see, OK, am I ever using these links? So in this very simple case, I, I have uh, memory coming in, adder coming in, multiplier feeding in. And I say, do I ever get these pieces of data? And if I ever use them, if it's ever possible to be used, I leave those links there. And if it's not possible for them to be used, I, I get rid of those links. 
And so this points to how do we do the simulation type stuff. So we have to look at these, these kind of symbols. We have to figure out, are we using these? And this is the kind of simulation that we get from the data we get from model sim. And we say, OK, we're not using uh, data one, data out, so we can get rid of that. We're using this, so we, do, we have to keep that. So we go from something like this to something like this, making our boxes smaller. And we can also see I'm not using this functional unit at all. Data is never being routed through here. So I can just totally get rid of that functional unit. So it's kind of nice and I can say I'm going to give you all the resources that you want. And if I'm, you're not going to use them, I'm just going to get rid of them for you automatically. And you used to do this matching. I mean, for example, if you have things like commutable operations, or whatever, what, yeah. for example, an addition, right. it doesn't care if it comes in on port right. A or port B. Right. So there's some kind of matching that you need to do. It's it's so it's mapped to instructions. So we assume, and there's a lot of I think really interesting research in, in that kind of. So how do I transform my my code in order to make this more efficient? We don't really look at that. So we just assume that. I'm going to have a compiler that spits out these instructions for me. And it's just made some selection. It's, it's made it somehow, yeah. And it's, it's kind of, in some sense, it's kind of dumb. So another really, really interesting thing that I think you can do is you can say, we're, in some sense, we're doing this binary. Like, we use this or we don't use this. But you could look at percentages. And you can say, sometimes, I'm only using this 1% of the time. I would really like to, can I somehow move this operation or change this the way that I'm doing this dynamic scheduling uh, to, to get rid of that? So. Um, we don't do that. But that's really interesting, I think. So uh, this is moving, showing you um, um, what you can, basically what you can gain using di the diff different algorithms. So in this case, you have to figure out what algorithms you want to use, because each algorithm is going to give you different types of trimming. Um, you can see as your resources go up, obviously in a general purpose case, you kind of get this quadratic uh, um, uh, area result. Um, and it stays, you know, somewhat static. So these are different types of uh, resources and, and different numbers. Um, and you can see it's, you know, it's still more kind of linear, maybe not quadratic. So you're, you're buying a lot. So you know, on the order of 60 to 80 percent you're getting in terms of this trimming. And the final thing is a memory controller. Um, so the memory controller is just figuring out where, who needs the data and where to send it. Um, and uh, you get this similar types of uh, savings here as well. So again, looking at the general purpose case, uh, just for the memory controller, and then looking at these different specific cases um, for the memory controller, how much you're saving by doing all these optimizations. So in this case, you're saving a lot. Uh, and you can see it varies across the, across the applications. And mainly, in general, the more complex the applications, the more likely you're going to use different things, so the less savings you're going to get. So this Cholesky de matrix inversion doing Cholesky de decomposition is, is a lot more complicated than a, vector, a vector multiply. So that's why it's, it's not saving you as much. Uh, these are all small. So these are originally for like MIMO matrix. A lot of the stuff we're doing is MIMO. So 4x4, four 8x8 four, eight eight kind of thing, because you're, you're doing operations on antennas. Um, I think we have results for the multiplication that I don't have here uh, on larger, because that was a question we got a lot. How does this scale into our thousands by thousands type things? Um, um, so in that case, um, you don't want to do the single core. You want to do the multi-core that I'm going to talk about. Yeah. I, I kind of question the comparison that you're making here, right? Because if you go back to, uh, to the previous slide, so um, you know, you're comparing against a, a, a fully connected system. Yep. And so processors do that by making a register file. Right. They use the register file as general purpose integer. Yep. It's, an, it's an all to all cross bracket yep. because yep. so you know how, how does that how does so we're just how would that compare that's that's what we're doing. So we have a register file and instead right, of I mean, the even, port even the register itself is actually then like, you know, a is is a is a form of interconnect. In the sense that so you can get from an addition to a multiplication by putting some value into a register file and pulling it out. Later. Yeah, so it, I, maybe you can think of it as we're trimming the ports, the register ports. So like you have, I can go from any register to, out to this port, and then you have the. So we're, we're we're doing both of that. So we're saying like the port. Sometimes you don't need to go from this register to this out, out to this port. Maybe this register only goes to port one, 
and so we get rid of that. Then. Good. Okay. Okay. So um, moving towards uh, larger matrix multiplication results, um, single core type things, um, showing just the area and throughputs of uh, of different. So this is essentially just adding more functional units and what it buys you. So you can do some sort of uh, limited uh, design space exploration here. And so the one thing you're seeing here is these two are the same. Um, you add, um, essentially here what you're doing is you're going to get rid of this adder. You don't need four adders. You have three adders, so it's going to trim away. So this, those design one and design two are equivalent, equivalent things. Um, and then showing um, on the single core kind of cases for the whole processor. So before I was showing you the individual parts how much you're, you're getting in terms of savings and area. So that was kind of the summation of all those three things that I showed you before. Um, and then also the throughput increases in throughput. So sometimes it's, it's not too much, sometimes it's larger. Uh, and these throughput increases are all coming at uh, the cost of, of uh, your clock frequency because we're using the same number of cycles. So we're, we're cycle accurate in terms of the processor and what we're doing, the application specific processor after we do the trimming. Okay, and then we wanted to see uh, how do we actually compare to people using different types of tools or people hand coding uh, to see if we're in the same ballpark because it's easy to compare against yourself and show some great results. Um, but, um, you know, some people have published papers on these different types of uh, uh, mainly matrix inversions is what we looked, looked for. Um, a lot of these were hand coded or using um, uh, these model based environments and we wanted to see are we in the same ballpark. And it's hard to do comparisons, mainly because a lot of times they don't report certain things. Um, they're different devices. We tried to do the best that we could to get kind of make apples to apples, but it's still like oranges to, I don't know, something else, tangerines or something. I don't know. Um, so, but it's the, the it, we're in the same ballpark, which honestly I was a bit surprised about. I didn't think we would be in the same ballpark as these papers that were published. Uh, written by you know, people sit, sitting there and trying to analyze what, what's going on. Okay, so I'll quickly go through this. I think we're about running out of time, but you know, you get it to the question of scalability. Um, so essentially, if I throw a lot of code at this, it's just gonna be, go back to my general purpose processor, which is good or bad. The good thing about that is it runs, it works. So if I throw a lot of code at Catapult or Impulse or Auto ESL, it may not work. It may just say, I'm synthesizing forever. I'm not going to work. In the worst case, we just say, I give up, but here's the general purpose processor that we have. Uh, but you're not going to get a lot of task level parallelism for this. So essentially what you can do is you can take all of these cores and then figure out how to multi-core them. And there's a lot of tough questions here that a lot of smart, very smart people, smarter people than I are, are looking at and how do you partition these across the, the different cores. So I'm not going to uh, belabor these points. Um, what we do is we have a consistent memory over all the cores. So we give you this very nice programming model where we say you can get data from anywhere. You don't have to worry about where your data is. And then we sit there and we analyze where do you actually get your data from. So we have as many cores as you want. Um, and then you, you, know, you have to do this partitioning and you give, uh, you give the code to this core and then we do all the trimming stuff that I just talked about on each specific core based on that code you've given it. And then you, you put the data all in just this really nice global array, this global memory. And so I don't need to worry about, okay, pass this, transfer this. And then what I can do is I can partition this based on looking and seeing what I'm actually using. So you can see that some, some of the memory or s some of the data is always being used by certain cores, so I can, I can just pull that locally. And then you can say some is shared between multiple cores, so I can have some shared memory going to these different places. Okay, so an example is uh, uh, doing matrix inversion uh, using QR decomposition. So you'll have your matrices, you do your QR decompositions, you pass your R matrix to the inversion step, the simple, more simpler matrix inversion step, uh, and then you do a multiplication to get your final results. So you can see this is kind of naturally, and this is a, not a contrived case, but a very nice case that works out well for us that, you know, this is all going to be mapped to local variables, this needs to be shared. So. So going through quickly a uh, multi-core, um, what, what we've done is um, taken matrix multiplication and made different types of cores. So the way that these differ is um, the A 
A1 cores are just doing uh, one vector mul multiplication, row by column, and getting one element. And then uh, an A2 core does two rows and columns, or sorry, one row and two columns. So you're getting two points. Um, and so you can see the different types of cores. So uh, the first three designs are the single core designs. Um, with different number of functional units, so different numbers of adders and multipliers. And then we go here, we go kind of a fully parallel 16, so this is on 4 by 4. And you can see, yeah, this is going to really increase my area, but increase my throughput. And then we say, okay, let's just use one of those sequentially, 16 times. Uh, let's use um, four of these, or eight of these A2 cores, let's, so on and so forth, right? And so we can kind of get different points in our design space. And so sometimes they're not optimal. So in this case, you'd want to go with design 7 over design 6 because it's smaller and faster. But it does give you this nice design space, which is what people are usually looking for. So going even further, so these kind of uh, four, through, 4 through 9 are, you could think of as homogeneous cores. Uh, these are more heterogeneous cores. You see uh, these cores have different types of uh, um, code on them. Um, and this is going to more complicated things, so QR decomposition, LU decomposition, Cholesky decomposition. Uh, mainly just showing that you're going to get this trade-off, which makes sense. Sometimes you're going to get higher throughput, but for more area. But at least it gives you some space. So this is, uh, again, another kind of surprising result. We say, okay, let's compare this with Catapult. Catapult sees Mentor Graphics C2 HDL uh, tool. I think it's, in my experience, it's, it's the best. At least theoretically, it does the most interesting optimizations. Um, and we have all these designs, matrix multiplications, and you can see the catapult design is here. And so we're kind of in the same ballpark. You know, it's, uh, sometimes they're better. They have a really nice um, throughput kind of versus area, uh, but we can get a bunch of different things. And then as this is simple, so four by four matrix, as you get more complicated, uh, our designs get, get to be a lot better. So comparing ours versus catapult on LU decomposition, we're smaller and faster. So same thing for uh, upper matrix inversion. So we're smaller and faster. Are you using the same Same, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's, it's, we're not trying to trick you and try to fool and do bad results. So that was kind of surprising, you know, I, I thought at least. I thought Catapult, they've been working on that for 15 years, you know, trying to make this tool great. And it's a nice tool. Um, and my graduate student who's now my postdoc has been working on this for three or four years by himself and the results are quite similar or better for larger applications. So that's our tool. Um, there's a lot of work to do on it. It's an academic tool for sure, um, meaning that you know there's the GUI's not nice. Um, it's a lot of uh, run this through it and then have my postdoc sit there and find the bugs and fix those bugs as you run more applications through it. But uh, it's, it's uh, you know, with a little bit of, of love and care, I think it could, could, uh, could rival a lot of these, these other tools. Um, so finally, uh, I just sit and listen to my students talk to me all the time. Um, I do none of this work really. I just get, get to come talk about it. So these are all the people that uh, have done all these really interesting projects and done all the work for, for all these projects. And people will give me money to do it. So that's it. If you have any questions, then I'll have to.